Hello YouTube, this is James. It's been a while since I made a video, so I thought I would do one on something that is relative to the moment, which is riding in the cold weather. Um, I'm going to start out with just an overview of my basic riding gear for the cold. As you can see, these here are my coveralls. These generally are my first I'm a layer of insulation. I'm a, I just put on, you know, whatever I'm wearing. If it's day off, blue jeans and a t-shirt. If I'm going to work, then, you know, dress slacks, dress shirt, nice tie, that kind of thing. But these go immediately over top of them. I like the coveralls because, you know, you have the zip up. This pair is a C.E. Smith, and I like the um, um, cuffs on these. They have the elastic in them, so, you know, that helps seal out the air. Um, coveralls are good, you know, insulation. You know, you're taking, you're, you know, you got layer insulation, and it connects your legs to your torso, so, you know, that kind of, you know, traps as much body heat as you possibly can. Um... Then the next thing I do is for my legs, you've seen these in a previous video where I covered, you know, wet weather gear. These are my, you know, waterproofed, and the, I'm wanting to say they're made out of a nylon, but these are a windproof material. Um, you know, just good, simple stuff like that. You know, if you have, you know, some leather riding pants that are big enough to go over top of, like, coveralls, you got some chaps that you can let out, you know, big enough to go over those. Leather makes excellent wind-blocking material, you know, and these are typically my outer layer. You know, I put these on, and, you know, you have the insulation of the coveralls along with, you know, whatever I happen to have on underneath, and then you have your wind layer on top to keep the air from just, you know, penetrating and, you know, blowing all that warmth of your body on out. Then, for the top, Lily found her a soft spot. I actually usually just put on two leather jackets. I mean, this first one here is a Croft and Burlow, and it is insulated. Um, My mother-in-law gave that to me a while ago. I like, as you can kind of see from the ruffles on it, you know, it's got some um, form-fittingness around the torso. So that kind of helps to um, uh, keep the wind out. And this one actually has a two-snap closure on the wrist. So when I, I, I honestly have smaller wrists for as big as I am. So I snap it up to the second one and that helps, you know, minimize the air that comes in. And then this is my actual riding jacket. And then I put this on over top of everything. Um, one thing that's nice about it is you can see from the zipper you actually have this, you know, leather flap and that creates a wind block barrier behind the um, um, zipper. So that helps, you know, keep the air out. And then normally when I'm riding in the cold, I will turn my collar up. You know, that just kind of gives a little protection for my neck. And, you know, it will it actually comes up high enough to, you know, help, you know, keep some of it off my ears. One thing I want to show you people is um, uh, the tag on here. This jacket is actually a 3X, which I normally wear a um, uh, just an extra large. You know, I didn't know it at the time because, you know, it was given to me by my father-in-law. But, you know, if you're going to look at, you know, some leathers for, um, uh, you know, the cold, you want to buy them oversized. That way, um, uh, once I put on, you know, the, my shirt, my coveralls, my jacket, and then my top jacket, you know, the, that 3X fits me real well once I get all that on underneath it. If I had just a regular 1X jacket on, then... You know, it would be, you know, really tight, really constricting. And I might not be able to get all this on underneath of it. So, you know, just something to think about is if you're going to buy cold weather gear, you know, go oversized. You know, the best, one of the absolute best insulators is air. So, you know, even if it is a little loose on you, 
you know that air you know that air trapped inside will warm up from your body heat and help to keep you warm as well for my hands I actually have see if I can get the light better there we go these are insulated leather gloves I'm a, I've had these forever they're Thinsulate insulation, 100 gram. Um, they work. They work real well. I mean, which you can see it in previous videos where I done a review on my bike. I have four wheeler hand guards that I made custom brackets for and put on. So between the leather gloves, which are windproof, I mean, with the insulation and the hand guards, you know I can ride comfortably down to 30. When it starts dropping down to the 20s. Then I start having some issues with, you know, my fingertips getting numb. Simply because the hand guards aren't quite large enough to block, you know, all the wind. So when I have my hands around the grips on the bike, you know, my fingertips are actually sticking out below the, um, uh, the hand guards on it. Um, and as to footwear, you don't want to go out in a pair of tennis shoes, folks. Invest in a good pair of boots. Something of the leather persuasion is always nice. You know, that gives you the windproofing along with... I mean, I mean, if you was to take a tumble, that would give you abrasion resistance. You know, protect your feet. I actually have just bought these not too long ago. I love them. Um, as you can see, they have the lace-ups and the zip. So, first time you put them on, lace them up, cinch them up nice and, you know, snug. And then it's a zip on zip off procedure the rest of the time um if you're going to buy a riding boot you know it is recommended that you have something with a lace or a system where you're able to kind of cinch it up that way it supports your ankles you know especially if you're riding you know big heavy cruisers you know holding up 800 pounds at a stoplight you know it, it'd be very easy to twist your ankle if you was to set it down in the pothole if you have, you know, something like my Doc Martens that I showed in a previous video where, you know, I'd waterproofed them. But, you know, there's no real ankle support to those. So, you know, something that you can kind of cinch up is nice. Um, another thing I want to show you, which, if you're a hunter, you know all about these. You know, good, thick, insulated socks, maybe something with wool in it. You know, if you can't stand wool, and you know, there's a lot of nice um, 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 man-made materials that they make these insulated socks out of. But, I mean, put you a pair of these on, and they help out tremendously. One thing I have noticed is where the boots are a zip closure, you, even though they have, you know, this little flap to them. Oops, drop the boot. This little flap here, you still get, you know, some air leakage around that. So, you know, these help keep your feet warm. If you don't have these or you don't want to invest in a pair, double up. You know, two pairs of regular socks gives you double the insulation of a single pair. Um, something that I've seen some people do, you know, I've tried it myself, but, you know, it don't, I didn't really notice that much of a difference, is people actually will double their gloves up. They'll take a glove, you know, like this here, I'm a, or something like a, I'm a, I'm a, like a, I'm a, not a flannel. Oh, I'm trying to think of the word. I'm a, but, I'm a, they'll take like a second pair, a second thin pair of gloves and put their windproof gloves over top of that and have two gloves on. Where those are leather and insulated, I've not really seen much of a difference. But, you know, some people might. You know, you just kind of have to try what you're looking at. You know, try it out. Um, one thing I'd like to note is that while you can put all this gear on, it keeps you nice and warm for the most part. You are going to have some areas that you can't, you know, completely keep the air out. I mean, like around your wrist, you're going to end up with air leakage, you know, around the, around the neck and around the ankles. You know, those are three points where, you know, you're going to have, you know, some, you know, heat loss. Um, if you happen to have one of these, a full face helmet is really, really nice for cold weather. I mean, you put it on, it protects your ears. You know, at highway speeds, shield down. 
I'm going to keep the I'm gonna wind out of your face. So, you know, it's just really nice to have. Um, one thing you can do, which I have a couple of helmets. I actually just went out with this open face. And I put on this right here. You know, that helped a lot. If you, you know, don't like, you know, you have some reason where you don't like or you can't use a closed face helmet, a good old, you know, ski mask and an open face helmet, you know, isn't a bad combination in the cold. I mean, I, mean, I, I went to town and back and was just fine with that. Um, trying to think if there's anything else at the moment that I need to show you as far as gear which I don't think I do. Um, I'd like to talk about just some basic riding tips. You know, if you're going to be out in the cold, you know, allow your, just like with a car, whenever you're traveling in cold weather, allow yourself extra time. You know, go just a little slower than you might normally run, you know, for the simple fact that once you get to about 30 degrees, you start having to watch for ice patches on the road. You know, and a lot of a lot of you know that is just knowing the route that you travel, you know, know where to look for puddles, you know, where you normally watch for puddles of water in the summer, watch for you know patches of ice in the winter. Um you know, if you do have to go across, you know, ice or something. You know, slow it down. Try to get it into first gear if you can. You know, most people are going to say, you know, you know, you, you don't drag your feet when you ride. You know, you don't drag your feet, you know, when you turn. You know, you don't drag your feet when you're going slow. But there are special cases where, you know, dragging your feet is a good idea. And, you know, having to traverse an icy parking lot is one of those times. You know, if the bike... You know, if the bike was to start, you know, kicking out from under you, you know, you have a better chance of getting it back in control, getting stabilizing yourself. You know, if it was to just walk out from underneath you, you've already got your feet on the on the ground, you can just step off the bike. I've actually done that one time. I, mean, I was coming out of the yard here with frost on back in the late fall. And I started to turn to come up and onto the road and the bike just walked out from underneath me and you know there it was laying on the ground and here I am standing next to it because I had my feet down you know I was being prepared for that sort of situation <coughs> excuse me I've had a cold this week and I've just about got over it so um of course it you know if you can avoid you know, going out in the snow and ice. If it's unavoidable, you know, just make sure you give yourself plenty of time. You know, use some good common sense. You know, if there's, if you know there's going to be slick spots, slow down. I mean, that kind of thing. Um, actually, I live, you got to go up and over a hill and then back down it to get down to where I live at. And underneath the hill here, there's probably a section of road about 100 foot long that still has snow and ice on it. But, you know, by going slow, first gear, feet down, you know, I'm able to just crawl across it, no big deal. Once I get past it, then the road's clear. So, you know, it can be done. You want to make sure that your tires are in good condition and properly inflated. You know, ice, you have very little traction on snow, it's not much better. So, you want to try to, you know, give yourself the best chances possible that, you know, your tires are going to, you know, hang on. You know, if you're riding on bald tires with, you know, overpressure or overpressurized, you're going to have a lot less grip than if you have, you know, good tread on them and the right pressure. One thing some people um, um, do in the off-roading community is um, um, they actually run lower tire pressures and what that does is let the tire flatten out and gives you a bigger footprint. You know, so that's an idea if somebody might want to try it. You know, I'm not advocating running tires low because you wear them out faster. 
But, you know, there might be certain circumstances where it might be a good idea to drop five pounds. And try it that way. It might give you a little better purchase on the road. But, you know, as soon as the conditions are back to normal, you always want to keep, you know, air your tires up back to what they're supposed to be. You know, I'm not giving any numbers out as to, you know, what you should air your tires to because it depends on the bike, your riding style, the tires you have, <coughs> and all that good stuff. <coughs> oh, excuse me. But, you know, just ideas about it. And one thing I want to say is that, you know, if you're riding a corroborated bike, you know, give it more time to warm up. You know, it, you know, 40, 50 degrees, usually they won't start, you know, they're not too hard to start. I like to never, it's like 20 degrees here, and I like to never got my bike to start. When I finally did, I had to let it sit for, I say, a good two or three minutes just to warm up before I could take off. In, you know, extreme cold, like 20 degrees or so, you know, you might have some issues with the um, uh, switch is not working correctly. I have a um, uh, kickstand kill switch on my bike that won't let me move if I'm in gear and the kickstand's down. And, you know, cold weather, sometimes, you know, I'll kick my stand up, let the clutch out and first, and it dies. Because the, um, uh, the coat's causing the spring not to have enough tension to return it back to the, um, uh, to close the circuit. So it'll go. So I have to you know, reach down, pull the plunger out with my fingers and start it back up. And another problem that I've had is with my clutch. My bike uses a wet clutch system. You know, this goes back into making sure you give it plenty of time to warm up. You know, you might have issues with your clutch not wanting to release or catch. I mean, especially with a wet clutch system because your oil's cold. <clears throat> I was coming home from work about a week or two ago and I thought I gave it enough time to warm up and when I went to stop at a red light I went to pull the clutch in and the clutch wouldn't move because it warmed up enough to where it would break free in the parking lot but the cold air running over the motor I'm a <coughs> caused it to I'm a stick again so I had to you know basically I'm a float the gears all the way down to first and just let it and give myself enough space and time to just kind of roll at it, just letting it chug at idle till the light changed and then I had to shift all the way back up into high gear for the highway <coughs> <coughs> without the clutch. So, you know, issues like that. Uh -huh. Which, you know, learning how to shift with and without the clutch, you know, should be basic, you know, motorcycle 101 something that you should practice, something that you should learn because you never know when a situation like that might arrive. You know, if I had forced the clutch in, I could have shifted, I could have stopped and shifted, but the clutch might not have released and I might have been sitting there on the side of the road I mean, with, you know, the clutch is in, but it won't return. You know, things like that. So, before I run this video too long, I'm going to sign off. And I just want to say, everybody, be careful, be safe, and enjoy life.